I found that video and uh, I thought it really was a pretty powerful concept when it comes to the way that we speak. And in this particular lesson, we're going to talk about what that video said. And that is that through our words, that we literally do have the power to make change. Now, obviously, our goal is not to make change in the same way that the world makes change. And uh, in that particular video, that lady was, was trying to help that blind man. You saw that. It was very clear that he was out begging. You may have seen individuals do that before. But the words that he used didn't declare anything that really connected with people. And I hate to say it that way, but him informing them of his predicament uh, and then setting a can out didn't do enough. But when she rewrote the words, she said the same thing, but you heard what she said. She said, I wrote the same thing, I just used different words. You know why that's significant is because words have power. I don't know if you've ever thought about the power of words. I want to I want to do something here, and you tell me if, if words don't have power. I'm going to describe a dish to you, uh, and it's the same dish, but I want you to see which one you prefer, the, the first one that I described or the second one that I described. You ready for this? You can see if you can guess what dish it is, okay? Um, this particular dish is very savory. As a matter of fact, the, the, the spices blend together in such a way that it draws you in and it want, you just want more of it. As a matter of fact, the way the spices, they mix um, with the, the meat uh, within this dish, it actually blends well and changes the flavor of the meat into something that's very positive. And when you, you combine that with, with some sort of noodle, I mean, after all, when those noodles get coated in that sauce, um, and then you can spin it around on your fork and... It is just such a wonderful dish. What do you think I'm describing? Spaghetti. Does it sound pretty good the way I described that? Some of you are like, sure. Okay, what about this one right here? Hey, you take some of this, you throw a little bit of oregano on it, you throw a little bit of beef into it, and you boil some noodles, put it together on a plate, and then you just eat it. What was I describing? Spaghetti. It's the same dish, but did one sound different than the other? The answer should be yes. I hope. I tried, right, to make them sound different. The reason I use that is because you've got to understand that as you learn to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, parting to, part of walking in the footsteps of Jesus is also learning to talk as Jesus talked. Now, you may think it doesn't matter if I come up to you and I tell you, hey, at the truth of the gospel, and if you don't obey the gospel, then you're going to hell, you would look at somebody and you say, well, Joe, isn't that the truth? And I would say, yes, but how many of you love it when people come up to you and say, if you don't do what I want you to do, then you're going to be condemned to hell for the rest of your life? And I would offer to you, none of us in this room would respond favorably to that either. But if you walked up to somebody and told them the truth of what the gospel is all about, 
all of a sudden then it, it may make a different impact. You see, as you and I consider Jesus walking on this earth, I want you to understand something, that Jesus, He not only knew what His mission was, but Jesus knew how to go about relaying that message of His mission. And it wasn't always received well. Look, we've already looked at that in this, te- in the, in this particular day. It, the message that you have and that I have is not always going to be able to be received well because it draws us to a point of having to make a choice. You've got to go right or you have to go left, but... Uh, To follow the Word means you can't stand still, but as Jesus had the goal of making the outsiders become the insiders, you and I have the same task. But what I want you to hear is this, the way you talk about heaven and the way you talk about Jesus can actually make somebody either want Him or not want Him. If you say this, I get to go to church, I get to go be with the church, or I have to go to church, Are those the same things? What does it relay to you if I say, I have to go to church? What does that that relay to you, young people? Which, by the way, I appreciate y'all not sitting up front. Appreciate y'all sitting in the back, seriously. It was a great um, great move. Yes, what does it relay? I don't want to go. I have to go. What else does it relay? I have to go to church today. What's it relay? You don't really like it. What else? What would you say? Anybody? Yes. I have no choice. Yes, sir. Well, if I say I have to go to church, I would love to say that would say I love it, but it sounds more like I have to go, right? Like I have to eat my broccoli. I have to eat my peas. I have to finish my plate before I get dirt. My mom says I have to clean my room before I can play video games, right? You understand that. But if somebody says I get to do something, what does that relay? Yes. I love to do it and it's a gift. What else? See, y'all just got bonus points. Yes. It's a privilege. I get to. What? It's a choice. It's a choice. Yes. It's a decision. That's right. Yes. You like it and you want to. Seriously, thank you all for moving up. I do appreciate that. It makes it easier not to speak to empty chairs. Thank you. You're right. Now, here's what I want you to understand. There is a big difference between I have to do something and I get to do something. So when you understand that, you've got to start understanding then the words that you use to describe relationship with God, the words that you use to describe your mission of being a disciple of Jesus, of following in His footsteps, it really does paint a picture in the mind of someone. Because your words actually paint pictures. I I thought this was interesting. I want to read this to you, right? Talking about shaping attitudes, outlooks, and purposes. Uh, There was a statement that was made in a book entitled 30 Million Words, Building a Child's Brain. And this particular book was dealing with the importance of regular conversation for the brain development of children, and it said this, no matter the language, the culture, the nuances of vocabulary, or the socioeconomic status, language is the element that helps develop the brain to its optimum potential. So as language can be used to shape the brain, to paint pictures, to shape attitudes towards something, And here's the question, young people. How are your words, how are your words doing at shaping your friends' perception of the church? How are your words doing at shaping the way your friends view Jesus? The way your friends view a relationship with God? When they hear you talk about it, do they hear, I have to go to church on Wednesday, that's why I can't play the video? Or do they hear, Hey, I get to go to Bible study. That's why we can't play video games. But why don't you come with me to Bible study and we'll play video games another time? You see, that relays two different pictures. And so as you and I get into this one real quick, because we don't have a lot of time, I want you to understand something, that as you are following in the footsteps, there is a conversion that should have taken place and a transformation that continues to take place, a metamorphosis if you will, like a a, a caterpillar forming a cocoon 
And then when the cocoon opens up, a beautiful what flies out? Tell me. A butterfly. Do you know the Bible uses that word? The Bible uses that word to describe our ongoing spiritual growth. That as, not butterfly, but wouldn't that be cool? Beautiful, yeah, that's neat. Like, we're all butterflies. Let's float around. But the idea is this, that as you and I understand that when we obeyed the gospel, there was supposed to be a change, I would offer this to you then. That means it's supposed to be a change in the way you talk about following Jesus too. It's not a have-to thing. It's a get-to thing. And when you and I look at Colossians 3, verses 1 through 14, and we won't read them all, it is of interest, though, in the very beginning where he says this, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things of where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. He'll go on to say there in verse 8, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abuse from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And why would I say that? Because as you and I understand following in the footsteps of Jesus, and the words that come out of our mouth matter. If I tell you I'm going to church on Sunday, but I look like a sailor on Monday, you've already told me that that tells you that I don't take my relationship with God serious. And if I tell you I have to go to church instead of I get to go study the Bible and worship God, then that tells you my attitude is I really don't want to be there. So as you and I understand this whole transition, the becoming a Christian, walking in the footsteps of Jesus, what it means then is I've got to talk a certain way according to the example that Jesus showed me. You see, Jesus spoke quite often with words that denoted His commitment to His plan. He would tell individuals that He didn't come bringing peace, but He came bringing a sword. He would tell those religious elite like we looked at last night, those adults who were here, that it wasn't the righteous who needed a physician, but those who were sick. In other words, you people, some of them, believed they were self-righteous, that they were good enough. They could help enough little old ladies across the street. They could rake enough leaves. They could go, go play checkers with people in a nursing home enough to make it where God owed them salvation. And Jesus said, you don't understand. You may be doing a lot of good things, but you are not your answer for sin. Jesus is your answer for sin. So what Jesus would tell those Pharisees, He said this, look, I know my mission. My mission, I'm committed to my mission. When you talk to your friends, let me ask you this. Number one, do you show commitment to God? I will show you three examples of individuals that were very committed to God in the way they talked, in the stances that they took, and I would even propose this to you, that in taking such strong stance, they were not being mean they were being bold. You remember Daniel, right? Daniel, the lion's den. How many of you have ever heard of Daniel in the lion's den? Raise your hand. Very good. How many of you have ever heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace? Who can tell me Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's given name by their mama? You know one? Does anybody know one? What about this one? Daniel chapter 1 and verse 7. Then the commander, actually, yeah, then the commander of the officials assigned names to them. Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Do you know that Shadrach and Abednego were not the names their mamas gave them? They were Babylonian names. And that meant this, that the Babylonians who had captured uh, the kingdom of Judah had, had brought these young men in. They were trying to transform them to serve in the kingdom of Babylon as prisoners. And so they gave them new names. Names that represented the Babylonian gods. When you really start looking at the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all those names had to do with Babylonian gods. And so they were told to bow down. When the, the instrument is played, this big, huge statue that is built, you're going to bow down. But Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah did not bow down. As a matter of fact, what they did was they stood up can you imagine standing up when everybody else is bowing down? Can you imagine when everybody else says, hey, this is the way we're supposed to do it? 
that you're the only one standing up saying we're not going to do it this way. And then when you get called on the carpet, you get to go in before the king knowing that the fiery furnace is waiting for you. And yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in chapter 3, verse 16 and following, they said this, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if He does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve you or worship the golden image that you have. Now somebody tell me what that cost them. What happened? Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yes. That's right. That's right. He said when they got thrown in the furnace, they didn't actually die. God protected them. And you're right. But here's what's great about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego learning to speak with commitment, right? They knew that that was going to cost them going into the fiery furnace. Here's what's beautiful. They knew that God had the ability to deliver them from the fiery furnace. But into the fiery furnace knowing that He would deliver them in the furnace. For all He knew, they were going to die. And God was going to take care of them in eternity. So their statement was one of bold conviction, not one that was any misconception that their lives could have been taken. But what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said is this, I'm able. Our God is able. I want words of commitment. When you look over at Acts chapter 4, you find Peter and John before rulers and the high priest, and they were not to go about preaching anymore. Jesus, and in Acts chapter 4 verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. In other words, they said, you quit preaching Jesus right now. And they said, we can't. Like a prophet of old who said, if I even tried, it would be like fire in my bones. I can't. So you may, you may go ahead and stop. You may go ahead and beat me. You may go ahead and do what you got to do. But the reality is, I will speak words of commitment. Even over in Job chapter 9, I won't read this one in its totality, but sometimes our words of commitment come when things are easy. You ever notice that? You ever notice it is to talk big when you're amongst Christians? On a day like today, you know we're all trying to be what God would have us to be. And so we're having fun. We're studying God's Word. Young men are leading us in great songs. Young ladies are singing out. I love it. It's really easy to talk about God today. But how difficult would it be to talk about God and conviction if you're around a group of friends that you know don't believe in God or maybe they're advancing some of the agendas that are around our culture today, and they're making fun of people who follow God. It'd be real easy kind of just to be a chameleon. I've oftentimes said teenagers are chameleons. Do y'all know what chameleons are? What's a chameleon? What's a chameleon do? You're going to give me a dictionary definition, aren't you? Go right ahead, man. Give it to me. It does camouflage. What does it do to camouflage? It changes color. Is that what you were going to say? It changes color. Why would you think I would say teenagers are good at being chameleons? Well, that's right. Why would you wear camouflage amongst the crowd? What does camouflage allow you to accomplish? I'm unseen. I fit in. I will not get chewed up and spit out by the, the group of teenagers that disagrees with me. A lot of times it's easier for God's people to wear camouflage in a culture instead of stand up and stand out. And I want to tell you, if you're amongst people here, it's easy to be God followers. My question is, how are you doing out there? Because Job would talk about words of commitment when it came to being in pain, when it came to, was it costing him, when he would lose everything. The idea of shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity was not said in the absence of pain. It was said in the midst of pain and suffering. He had lost loved ones. He had had his material possessions taken away. It wasn't fair. And Job speaks words of, of commitment in those times. So number one, what I want you to understand is this. When you and I learn to speak like Jesus, Jesus was very bold in what he came here to do. He would even say that He came to do the will of the Father, 
to speak the words that the Father gave him. He wasn't going to back down even in the face of being disliked and persecuted himself. It wasn't that he was mean though. And that's what I want you to understand. Even when it comes to the speech of our Savior, you and I are talking about walking in his steps, then you and I have got to speak words in love. Now, here's the deal. Look, you say, Joe, that's twice you've mentioned love. We're ready to hear, you know, something else about, you know, give them the gospel. We're ready to hear. You've got to be honest with people. And here's what I want you to hear from me. I'm all for that too. I even would say that giving somebody the gospel is love. But I also difference between hitting somebody over the head and somebody understanding that you're telling them the gospel out of love. There's a difference in that. And your words can oftentimes reveal that difference. You ever had somebody come up to you? Maybe not because all of you are in great shape. Can you imagine somebody, though, of my physical characteristics? You know, I tell people all the time I'm in shape, by the way. Do you know round is a shape? I'm in shape. I don't need to get in shape. I'm in shape. If somebody says you need to get in shape, that means different shapes. Like, what do you want me to be? A square? You know, I don't know. Kind of like in round, you know. But either way, the idea is this. That some people may come up to you and say, you're fat, you need to lose weight. And then somebody else may come up and say, look, Joe, I want you to be around for a long time. How about you not eating three chocolate chip cookies, just eat one. I don't like either of those people, just so you know. Okay? But one of them sounds different than the other, doesn't it? One of them sounds a little different. Now, here's the deal. You can go up to somebody and you can say, look, if you don't obey the gospel, you're going to hell. Or you can go up to somebody and say this, look, our, Jesus died on the cross so that you and I could live in eternity. When you die, something's going to happen. I want you to go to heaven. That's a different way of saying the same thing. Just like that video, that video she said, I said the same thing, I just used different words. Sometimes the words you choose can shape attitudes and opinions. That's why when we talk about this concept of speaking with love, I want you to understand that Jesus made it very clear that the way you speak, it reveals what's inside of you. And that's not only in regular talk, that's also when it comes to telling people about Jesus. That's why you and I read in Matthew chapter 12, verse 4, as they are reading here, the, uh, the Pharisees actually he says, you brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. And he's right. The mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Matthew chapter 15, he would say the same thing in verse 18. Pretty much so he said, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. And so whether or not genuine love is part of who you are, not just a part of what you perform, right? You show up and you have your Christian face on. You may, you know, you know you're like, hey, we're on a mission trip. We got to get, you know, be a certain way. We got to show ourselves a certain way. You come up and you have that fakeness about you of, hey, you know what? We're here with so and so Church of Christ. And I'm not suggesting that you can't do that, but here's the reality. I want to know whether or not it's real within you before I want to listen to what you say. And so oftentimes what that goes back to is the walk you have with people. Last night we talked about Jesus being a friend of sinners and what that meant because there is a relational aspect to leading other people, bringing other people into the footsteps of Jesus. And if you're going to walk the way Jesus walked and talk the way Jesus talked, then you cannot be playing at Christianity. This isn't something you do sometimes. This is just who you are. And so when you and I think about this, then the love that comes forth from our mouth and our attitude and the words we use actually must be in our hearts. Because you can detect a hypocrite from a mile away. One of the things I've learned about teenagers, you all have a hypocrite detector. You can tell when people are genuine and when they're not genuine. You can tell, because if they're not genuine, you don't care what they say and you don't hide it well. You don't hate it well. That's why at times you get into arguments with your parents. Not because you said something that was unintelligent, which you do often, but it was that you didn't hide your emotions well. 
You said, Joe, are you saying I should hide my emotions? I'm saying you probably shouldn't have the emotion. But here's the truth. Because you can pick out a hypocrite, other teenagers around you can pick it out when you're being hypocritical too. That's why I'm saying this can't be something that this can't be something that you do on Sundays and Wednesdays. This has got to be who and what you are. And so here's the deal. You have the truth of the gospel. Those of you who are Christians, you've obeyed the gospel. You understand what it is to leave darkness and enter into light. You understand what it is to not have salvation, but to now have salvation. You, wonder, you know what it is to have no hope, but now have hope because of Jesus Christ. You know the truth. Look, I, I can tell you this right now. The way y'all answered Bible Bowl questions was beautiful. You can know the truth. You can study the truth. But here's what I want you to hear. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and following. The Bible says this. Actually, yeah, chapter 4. Is that it? Verses 14 and 15. Mm, yeah. The Bible says, as a, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickiness of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But listen to verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. I wrote here, the truth is what I tell you, in love is the attitude that I let flow through my words. Right? I can tell you the truth, but it not be in love. I can tell you the facts, but what I want you to hear is this. Jesus wasn't just about facts. Jesus was about bringing people to a desire to want to choose to follow his, his Father. And so when you and I think about following in the footsteps of Jesus, what I want you to hear is this. Words of commitment. How are you speaking about following God? Because I don't hear Jesus. Can you imagine? I'm talking about walking in the footsteps of Jesus. I cannot believe that I have to die on the cross. I cannot believe that I have, I have to be whipped. I cannot believe that He's making me do this. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? I can't either. And the reason I can't was because Jesus wasn't so into this. He was fully committed to this. And in so doing then, the attitude and the urgency of bringing other people to follow because he understood the necessity between salvation and damnation. He understood the difference between life and death was so serious that he would plead with them. And that's what the Apostle Paul would say is that as he talks to people, he wants to draw them in. I find it quite interesting when the Bible talks about the words that we choose. I want you to listen to this. Because your words have great power. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 says this. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Do you know the words you use can either diffuse a situation or it can escalate a situation. And the same is true when you're trying to bring people to Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification. That means building one another up to the need of the moment so that you will give grace to those who hear. In Psalm 19, 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In other words, the words that come out of your mouth, they can either be acceptable to God or not acceptable to God. And what I want you to hear today, young people, is this. That in walking in the footsteps of Jesus, you've got to talk the way he talked in order to show people what he showed people. Because just having the truth is not enough. It's not. It's like the individual who, who continues to seek the, the uh, approval of his father by working hard, but he never gets the approval. Well, it very well may be true that he didn't work up to his father's standards, but that father in revealing the heart in his words destroys the son. An individual will work hard to get straight A's as a freshman year of college because he wants to, to garner his father's admiration and his father's compliments. He calls his father to ask if he's proud of him and dad replies, I'll have to call you back soon, son. I'm busy. The boy feels rejected. Why does he feel rejected? 
because the Father never gave him words that affirmed him, nor words of love. The power of words, it really does have the power to repel or the power to draw. It has the power to paint the appropriate picture or the power to have people walk you by. So I want to bring you back to that video. What made the difference? There were a lot of people who were passing by that poor baby. The truth, but people still passed by. When the lady changed words so that made a connection with people, that I said the same thing, I just used different words. Young people, that's what I want to challenge you with in this lesson. As you walk in the footsteps of Jesus, understand the way you talk about your walk matters. Let's pray, and then we're going to break out. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, to enjoy this time of study. And now, Lord, I pray that as we break out into small groups, that you will bless the conversation. I pray these young people, Lord, that at this point in time, they feel comfortable enough with one another to really open up and to have a good conversation. I pray that these are good times for them, that they will grow and that much will be accomplished for your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. John?